This is the, the, the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains, everyone. I'm Nathan Williams. So I was talking with Neil before I recorded this episode, and uh, I'll tell you two things that we were talking about. The first thing is we were discussing the recent Bitcoin rise. Now, we're recording this on Sunday. By the time I post this midweek, I don't know what Bitcoin will do, but at current time, we're looking at about $11,000 of Bitcoin. And I asked Neil, is this manipulation? What's going on? His take on it is that it doesn't look like manipulation. There's too much money going into it. What this is, in his point of view, is a result of instability in financial markets. So there's been a lot of uh, instability and activity uh, between China, the U.S., uh, and money has been moving from traditional fiat markets into gold. Gold has been going up at the same time, and when whenever there's financial instability in the market, people seek out more illiquid assets. And so his take is that people are just moving into Bitcoin because it's a hedge against the current market. So that's interesting. And the second thing we were talking about is, it's been on all the news, Libra coin, Facebook's cryptocurrency that they're trying to launch. Um had a couple of different opinions on it, uh, people asking me what my opinion was uh, on our Telegram group. Um, I'll tell you, I'm skeptical. You know, it claims to be a cryptocurrency that is going to be decentralized, but yet, according to, uh, according to them, Libra will prevent fraud by having all accounts and transactions verified, prod, fraud prevention built in throughout the Calibra app, uh, accounts verified with government-issued ID, and Facebook and WhatsApp accounts uh, information used to sort of cross-reference against it. They'll have in-app reporting and dedicated customer service, uh, in order, and they can reverse transactions to give a refund if there's fraud. This seems to be fiat in, uh, in disguise as crypto. And my question is, if you've got that level of control, even if you're decentralizing, you're decentralizing to maybe 20 or 30 different companies, all who are, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, maybe technically it works very well. Um, but we're not talking about tracking CO2 emissions with a blockchain here. We're talking about a cryptocurrency. I wonder what the motivation is. And I can think of two possible motivations that I do not like. Motivation number one could be that Facebook wants to gather financial data on transactions for everyone who's part of the system. And maybe this is why so many other companies are paying $10 million for the right to run a note. That's honestly the least scary of the options that they want to have better financial data and cross-reference that to all the WhatsApp data and all of the Facebook data so that they know everything about uh, about us. The more scary option is that they're trying to recreate the world's reserve currency, that they're, they're doing what blockchain was built to do originally, which was to erode the power of centralized governments, erode the power of central banks, by being able, being able to control the money supply and create their own financial uh, policies. And it's interesting the how I feel about that because, you know, I like Bitcoin because it decentralized and, and took the power away from the billionaires who were able to game the system and make the rules. But it's different when it's... 28 or 30 or 100 multi-billion dollar corporations that are doing that. Isn't it? It's just another government. If you've taken if you've eroded the power of government and replaced it with a couple of uh, of multi-billion dollar corporations setting all the rules, isn't that just another government, but one that isn't accountable to people? That's what I find scary. Uh, maybe 
Maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe I'm overthinking this. But these are the two sort of scary possibilities that I can see. There may be others as well. Maybe they just want to raise a billion dollars. That seems like a small amount of money for something like Facebook. But who knows? Anyway, that's my thought. Um, I don't know enough. We'll wait and see how it goes. But whenever big corporates who have problems with privacy get into the cryptocurrency space, I'm like, are you really doing this just for my benefit and to guard my privacy? I don't think so. Let's leave all that dystopian thought behind us and move into looking at another blockchain project. I had the chance to speak recently with the team from Algorand. Algorand is a primary layer protocol. Uh, they joined us from New York. And so now I present to you my talk with them. Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams. Joining me today is the team from Algorand. We've got Paul Rigelli, the head of product, and Yossi Gilad, the CTO and head of systems research, here on the show, joining me live from New York. Thank you guys for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. I, I actually met some people from uh, the Algorand team. I think I, I got to meet your CTO while they were uh, coming through Berlin maybe a few months ago. And uh, it, it struck me as an interesting project. Now, you guys are a primary level blockchain or a primary layer blockchain. So uh, you've got a new unique consensus algorithm. You've raised a significant amount of money and you've uh, you've gone out to try and get people to build on you. Um what is different about Algorand versus something uh, versus the other layer one blockchains like uh, Stellar or Ether or uh, or Bitcoin? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Nathan. I think one of the the kind of base level questions when you talk about uh, foundational blockchain protocols is the blockchain uh, trilemma. So most projects struggle with uh, a a difficulty in trade offs between security, scalability. Uh, and um, and decentralization. <laughs> Sorry about Boom, that. Boom, you got it. <laughs> security, uh, security, scalability, and decentralization. Uh, and so when you look at a number of different projects, they've each kind of given up on on one of those axes. Um, you know, easy ones to pick on are, are Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, where you're seeing transactions per second on the order of uh, five to ten, um, and and that's just not really going to cut it in a in a real mainstream world where people are trying to build mainstream applications. Uh, with a, a, a blockchain um, backbone. And so when you look at the Algorand project, we really believe that we have uh, solved the blockchain trilemma uh, where we have scalability on the uh, orders, two orders of magnitude better than anything on the market. We maintain a decentralization across a number of axes that we think uh, really sets us apart. Uh, and from a security perspective, you know, we take into our, uh, our security model, not just security of the protocol, uh, but also the network itself. And that's part of our security model. Uh, and so we, we think we've got some real differentiation there. When you look at actual businesses that are trying to build on blockchain, usually they have a couple of problems. Uh, one is it simply can't keep up with the number of transactions they need to do. And so they just simply run into a wall there. Uh, but then the second one is really around their developer experience uh, and being able to actually integrate into that blockchain. And that's another thing that we've really spent a lot of time and focus on is building up that developer toolkit, our SDKs, um, and our developer relations team to make sure that when folks actually need to uh, build on the blockchain, we're there to help them out. So normally when I hear the trade-off, it's uh, I, I don't usually hear it in a, as a trilemma. Usually people talk about like a, a dilemma uh, that you uh, either want something to be decentralized or you want it to scale. And, uh, for, and the classic example is you want something to be sort of secure and uh, and uh, and decentral. So you've got Bitcoin, but then if you want to get more than ten transactions a second, you have to have a proof of stake algorithm or uh, or some sort of proof of authority or something where you have more trust in fewer nodes. So you're trading off decentralization for scalability. How does Algorand approach the problem? So we are taking. Uh a different approach, right? We're using uh, Byzantine agreements to reach consensus on the blocks. And uh, like really, if you go and you look at the sort of literature in computer science, Byzantine agreements uh, have been studied from the 80s. They are the way to reach uh, consensus where you, in, in a group of uh, participants, when you uh, might have some malicious actors. Um, now, the reason 
or a problem with using them in the context of blockchains um, is uh, basically the scalability. They usually require everyone to communicate with everyone and uh, several rounds of communication. So there are these issues, but also um, you must have some kind of uh, limit to the number of uh, bad actors. And uh, really, uh, there, there's a great prize. So if you if you manage to get Byzantine agreements, uh, that's the goal we were working for. You get a lot of security benefits. You get you can you can reach high throughput. You can uh, confirm. Uh, with you might be able to confirm with low latency if you design your protocol right, uh, but you have to really uh, sort of tackle these two fundamental problems, right? How do you deal with uh, a single bad actor impersonating many bad actors? And um, how do you deal with the performance uh, challenge of sending messages in a broadcast mode? Um, now, to deal with these problems, we're taking a proof-of-stake approach. When we're selecting participants, so anyone can participate, we select out of out of everyone out of this crowd, we select uh, participants to propose blocks and vote on blocks to confirm them. And selection is done uh, according to stake. W- one of the sort of tricks we have is the way we we select people. So you need to somehow do this in a fair way, right? So that is another challenge that we handle. Our white papers kind of describe the the mechanism we're using to do that. So, so just so just to make sure I understand, so you are running a proof of stake algorithm. That means that if I want to join your blockchain, the the Algorand blockchain as a full node, I can buy some Algorand coins and I can stake them, and my computer then is eligible to make the next blocks. And so then you select, or I guess uh, the algorithm randomly selects uh, some people who are stakers uh, and they're able to stay uh, to create the next bunch of blocks just going in turn is that more or less how this works so um kind of i think i i'd like to the, you mentioned staking your your algos or your currency mm-hmm. right or your tokens uh, we're not really staking them so there are some uh, I, I know there are some uh, types of solutions where you would actually like put your tokens on the table, and if you were to do anything malicious, like they would be taken away. Essentially, you put some money in custody. We're not doing that. So that's literally a way to uh, weigh the voters. So it's it's just anyone who happens to own algos, or, or, or how does it work? How do you... If you, if you have algos uh, and you have brought them online, so you're running a node and you, you are associating those algos with the node, uh, you are eligible to be selected uh, to be both a proposer and a verifier uh, for those blocks. And you are selected through basically a local random lottery through a, a verified random function, uh, which is a, a cryptographic um, uh, function co-invented actually by our founder, uh, Silvio Macali, uh, that allows us to randomly choose within a band of like how many people we want to be chosen. It is verifiable that they, they can prove that they have been selected and it is also not uh, forgeable. So you can't fake your selection as well. I think I, re- I remember him talking about this and that uh, the algorithm uh, come, uh, it has something to do with things that, uh, that can't be manipulated, like the addresses or, or something like that. I've, I've forgotten exactly. Yeah. But, the, but the randomness in it means that if I want to cheat the system and I've buy a million algos and set up a million nodes, there's still not that much of a chance that I would gain control over the system and could fake entries. That, that's right. And actually, our approach using the fiber random functions have another, it has another very important um, uh, benefit. So first of all, it's very lightweight, so anyone can run it. Um, and that allows us to change the participants very, very often. In fact, like every time we uh, approve a block or every time you vote on a block, you get selected, you won the lottery again. And uh, the, and the idea is that when you send your message, let's say you send your block, you get selected to propose. So you send your block, you attach the proof of selection to that block. Um, and that means that by the time someone knows 
you get selected. Before you propose the block, no one knows you get selected. After you propose the block, it's already out there propagating the network. So even if, let's say, someone found out that you are the block proposer, they would not be able to, or uh, it would be very hard for them to take you offline, like in a denial of service attack, right? Um, same thing goes for, for the people who are voting on blocks. Um, the proof is non-interactive, so they, they can just attach that to their vote. It sounds like, uh, and forgive me for this, but it, it does sound like this is a very complex algorithm and a very complex uh, solution. And I would expect, I, I totally expect that the problems in blockchain that need solving, that require this sort of magic bullet to balance or to, to weave their way through the, the trilemma of decentralization, scalability, and security would be very complex. But I wonder if, does that lead to a new problem, which is that the correct solution that balances all those three issues is complex enough that only a very few people understand it? And does that take, uh, make it more difficult for you to get adoption? I'd say a couple of things. I, I think you're right. I think the problems are very hard, uh, which is why you know, I look at a lot of the technology in the market today, and I think it's, it's basically proof of concept. Everyone agrees that this is, this is a, a super interesting concept, has lots of applications, and has the opportunity to fundamentally disrupt a number of markets. But at the same time, the technology itself, really, it's hard to bring any applications mainstream. Um, and so I think, and I think that is because of the exact reason you stated. It's, a, it's hard problems to solve. And I think that's sort of the genesis of our company, of Algorand. Uh, our founder, Silvio Macaulay, is a Turing Award winner. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of research here. In fact, our research team is uh, roughly the same size as our engineering team. Um, and, and we're all about sort of churning through that science, that smart science, coming up with the solutions uh, to these hard problems. And, and you're right, sometimes it is complex. In terms of whether we think the complexity of the, of the solution will impact the adoption, that's an interesting question. I, I would say a couple of things. Um, one, if you look at other technology solutions in the market, just forget blockchain entirely. Uh, like, let's talk about a, uh, a router as an example. How many folks using routers can, uh, can go through the math and the coding necessary to make that work? <laughs> like, like one Fair. model versus the other model. Like, let's talk about how it's actually routing those packets, right? It's not a, it's not a thing. Like, nobody really asks that question um, because people say, oh, yeah, routers. I know what those do. I want the one that goes faster. Yeah, I and, want the and, one that I can just put a plug in my, my, my cable and then it works. That's exactly right. And, and in blockchain, because the technology really doesn't work quite that well yet in, in what has been out in the market so far, Everyone wants to dive into those technological details. Like, hold on a second. What's going on with the, you know, a, a vote on the certification? What encryption are you using? How are you routing that through? Are you gossiping? Like, they're diving way down into the technology. Um, as we start to see the second wave of, of, of uh, blockchain technology companies, such as Algorand, coming to market, where we're breaking through a lot of the issues uh, and bringing scalability and bringing something that just works along all three axes, scalability, decentralization, uh, and security. I think what you'll see is people will be maybe less, uh, the, the, the majority will be less interested in the very technical details and more interested in the fact that it works. Um, this is an interesting question. This, this brings me to something I have seen in many other projects in the industry, uh, which is the more decentralized it gets, the more it seems to be subject to a central information source. Like, uh, so if people don't quite understand how things work, how should they find out if yours is better than, uh, you know, fake Toshi or, uh, or, or um, you know, the, the, the centralized uh, database masquerading as, uh, as a blockchain that goes 100,000 transactions a second because it's actually just a database. Um, uh, people will look to maybe uh, industry authorities, uh, but does that lead to a new level of decentralization that we hadn't anticipated? Well, so I think that's a good question. And that's something that we've been talking about a lot here at Algorand is as we push the industry forward and we bring forth a solution that, uh, that is really innovative on a number of levels, there needs to be a, a maturation 
in the way that the business world looks at blockchain technologies and how they evaluate blockchain technologies. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to, to network appliances. For some reason, I'm hot on network appliances today. <laughs> uh, but if you go to that route, if, you, if you're shopping for routers, there's a, there's a thing that vendors call speeds and feeds. How fast is it? Uh, what's the throughput? And it, the vendor themselves doesn't necessarily give you that number. The, um, the testing, you know, the standards and testing agency for uh, network appliances gives you those numbers. And uh, we believe fairly strongly that there needs to be something similar in blockchain. So Hyperledger has a project around standards. Um, other folks are, you know, there's some businesses that are just starting up around, you know, creating some standards for testing and uh, in the so-called speeds and feeds, you know, what is the TPS? What is the throughput? Uh, what is the, you know, the safety parameters, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and we are actively working on a number of fronts to help the industry mature in that area and to get that sort of standards agency that everyone can look to and trust to, to, to be able to uh, honestly compare across blockchain technologies. So what's your thought on the level of trust we should have? I mean, I come from uh, a background where I guess I wasn't the earliest comer to blockchain, but I was a big believer for a long time in decentralization. No one should trust anyone as the future. We're seeing now more and more projects saying, okay, well, maybe we do need standards. Maybe we do need, uh, uh, there's a place for private public, uh, private chains and public chains. There's a place for enterprise chains and uh, and blockchain societies and people who would be trusted people. Um, what's your take on this? Is there a place for both? Uh, or should we head more towards decentralization of everything? Or uh, can we trust uh, in groups or individuals to create standards for us? I mean, frankly, the default should be that trust should not be required. Uh, but then it's really up to each individual person. Like, where, what is your trust level? And are there solutions available to you that meet that trust level? Um, I think if you want true mass market adoption, then you have to provide solutions which require trust because I think your average person just can't grok a world in which, you know, there is no trust. Um, but, that, but that means having, having solutions up the spectrum to, to meet individuals' trust levels, whereas the default, like if you really want to just use Algorand yourself, the default should be you don't need to trust anything. Uh, you can view the source. Uh, you can compile it yourself. You can watch the messages and track the metrics and, and have, uh, have zero trust at all. That's interesting. Do you think that that's where blockchain's headed? I mean, we've seen sort of this ongoing evolution or this, uh, this progression from, uh, from decentralization uh, as an end into itself from uh, sort of the crypto past toward enterprise blockchains and uh, corporate adoption of blockchain. What do you see as the next wave coming? Well, certainly, I think to, to my point earlier, you know, the move towards decentralization as an end in itself, I think what that has to mean is an, uh, the default, the base level, the foundation uh, has to allow for a trustless uh, interaction or a, a trustless system. Um, but then to get, to get broader appeal, like people need to build on top of it. So I, I think that the big disruption you're, you're seeing in the industry is changing that foundation to be trustless. And then, you know, the market can build whatever solutions they want on top of it that, that get market adoption. Um, does, that, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I think that, I, I think that, that, that answers the question. It, it brings up a, another interesting one. What, who builds on Algorand and who do you want to build on Algorand? Um, and to clarify a little bit, when we sort of began the crypto boom in 2017, we saw a lot of people rush to build on Ethereum, and mostly because it was well known and easy. It was the strongest and most robust system out there at the time, or at least the one that had the longest track record. Um, and but a lot of it was based on the crypto hype, uh, uh, the ability to do an ICO and raise fifty million dollars overnight. Um, now that we're sort of in the the new era of twenty nineteen. What sort of projects are, do we see coming up? And is there the same hype to build on new layer one blockchains? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have really uh, folks building on us across telecommunications and e-payments, uh, insurance, asset tokenization, media and entertainment. It's really sort of spread across a number of places. But I think the common thread uh, across those businesses is that uh, is two things. 
One, they're looking for a technology which can handle the kind of throughput and scalability that a, uh, a, a real business needs. Um, and then secondly, these are folks looking for, so I'll, I'll give you an example. If you are uh, a, a company and you're looking for a vendor of some sort, a technology vendor, um, what does that normally look like? Well, you call up the technology vendor, you ask them a bunch of questions. Uh, maybe they fill out a form, you have a couple meetings, you decide, uh, yep, I like this better vendor better than that vendor. And then you form that partnership relationship. And then when you have issues, you call up that vendor and you say, hey, I'm having problems over here and they fix it for you and you know things are going well. In the blockchain world, what you see a lot of times is there is literally no one to call. There's no one to ask. There's no one to uh, uh, you know, d- decide if this is going to be a good partnership for your business. And that makes it hard for the larger enterprises and businesses that are used to that kind of relationship to choose a technology partner that they're willing to invest in long term. And that's one of the differences, I think, that you'll see with Algorand is that uh, folks can call us. They can talk to us. Uh, they can, uh, you know, have that partnership with their blockchain uh, technology provider in a public and permissionless world. So this is different from, you know, the, the similar kind of thing with a, a private blockchain or permission blockchain. They can have the best of the, both worlds with uh, with Algorand, and that's why folks like uh, Otoy uh, is building on top of us, who is a um, a, uh, a digital uh, digital rights and and GPU. Um, uh, crowdsourcing uh, company. We've got Asset Block, who's bringing tokenized real estate and REITs to, to Algorand. SyncSort, which is a, an enterprise grade uh, uh, data um, uh, aggregator for folks like enterprises who have data across um, NoSQL systems and SQL systems and mainframe systems and blockchain systems. And they can bring together that transactional data in a way that makes it uh, highly valuable uh, for those enterprise companies. And so I think that's that that's that's what we're seeing uh, in Algorand and, and why those folks are coming to us. It's interesting. Um, I remember back in the day, uh, any new level one blockchain would have to have some sort of venture fund in order to invest in, in in new companies to build on that. Are you still seeing that sort of necessity in order to attract new projects, or or is it all organic flow? We're seeing a little bit of both. Uh, we're definitely getting organic flow uh, and. Um, yeah, de- de- definitely a little bit of both. Great. So tell me, um, right now, at the time of the recording, we're sitting on mid-June 2019. Uh, what should we expect from Algorand going forward in the short term, in the medium term, and uh, the long term, like six months to a year? First of all, uh, we've announced the auctions, right? our strategy towards decentralization for the network, and going live. Um, another thing uh, we investing in is uh, new cryptographic techniques um, y- using better signature schemes uh, using better cryptographic primitives to reduce the cost uh, of operating the network of being part of this network right so after you've bootstrapped uh, we don't want nodes to send so much information um, so we, we're looking for ways to compress data so we can uh, we can have a sustainable uh, high even higher throughput. Um, another another idea we're we're looking into uh, uh, that is enabled by these cryptographic techniques, creating uh, sort of self-validated transactions, a transaction that you just post and anyone can you know can can check that is correct because of the information recorded in that transaction. They don't have to keep track of the balances for everybody, and so. We have all sorts of uh, this type of more infrastructural ideas. And then on top of them, we are building, uh, we are building new, um, new mechanisms that uh, facilitate better trades. Um, we have the idea of atomic square swaps, a very fast way to do atomic swaps. We have an idea for doing post and sale transactions, a new type of um, a new type of transactions that allows someone to just post that they want to sell something. And then as soon as a buyer comes along, the item can be sold. And so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas going forward that we believe can, can actually impact uh, the way we do trade today. 
Hmm. It sounds very exciting that you guys are right on the cutting edge of technology, that you've got a lot of really interesting developments that you're working on, and uh, I'm excited to see what Algorand, uh, Algorand does in the future. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Paul Regal and Yossi Gilad uh, from Algorand, the head of product and CTO, with me on Analysis and Chains. Have a good one, guys. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.